but as far as I'm concerned, I can separate the uniform from the man. I feel very bad that four men are dead, but I'm not sorry that four highway patrolmen are dead. Do you believe that uh, there should be a death penalty? A death penalty? Yes, for someone who commits a murder or something like that. Aren't we all born to die? Well, Manson uh, claimed that there really wasn't any such thing as death. It was just a state of mind. In a gas chamber. Well, uh, he said he'd rather kill a, a human being than a bird or even a rattlesnake. See, um, people think that murderers are a separate class of people. Actually, we're no different than anybody else. America is still number one in murder. Oh, we're not number one in many other areas. We were 15th in shipbuilding the last time I checked. And American prestige has taken serious blows around the world. Perhaps the sun is setting on a kind of a quasi-American empire these days as we continue to retreat, withdraw, suffer reversals, and are impugned and ridiculed as a wave of new communist nations spurn and scorn the United States. But there's one significant way in which we still lead this world, and that's murder. More and more, even our policemen are the victims of criminal attacks and of brutal murders, even being set up where people will call as if it were an emergency and say that a rape or a robbery or a mugging is taking place and please hurry to such and such an address only to be met by a shotgun blast at the door. As a matter of fact, here in America, the home of the free, the land of the brave and of the dead, about 10,500 people were murdered last year. And every single year, it continues to rise. The U.S. murder rate, and that rate is proportionate to population, by the way, not just the raw figure of the number dead. The U.S. murder rate is more than twice that of West Germany. It's nearly three times the rate of murder in France, and over four times the rate of Australia, and over 25 times the murder rate of England. And if anything, those comparisons are probably very much misunderstood and understated simply because other nations in their reporting include attempted murder, while in the United States we do not. In the last 10 years, the murder rate in the United States has more than doubled. Traditional murder centers like Detroit and some of the other cities, and there are many murder centers, Los Angeles among them, but they continue to sustain more killings than many entire nations of all of Scandinavia and the European countries. New murder capitals arise, such as Atlanta, which only a few years ago was considered a peaceful, calm, and fairly tranquil city, immune from some of the big tensions that grip the big eastern cities and the sprawling megalopolises that are split and divided with their inner urban ghettos. And now, Atlanta, with a burgeoning population of over 500,000, tallies as many murders each year as in all of Great Britain. As the number of murders continues to rise, the pattern of murder changes. Police find that both murderers and victims tend to be younger these days. While homicide rates are still highest in the central cities, the fastest growing rates in recent years have been right out on the farm, in rural areas, and in the suburbs. But neither growing murder rates nor changes in the murder patterns can tell the entire story. We talked with Vincent Bugliosi, who was the chief prosecutor in the Charles Manson case and who has since co-authored a book about the Manson murders entitled Helter Skelter. Mr. Bugliosi, are crimes of murder increasing or decreasing in our country? Crimes of murder, according to all statistics from the FBI and every other law enforcement agency, shows that they're uh, on the increase dramatically throughout the country. Are convicted murderers any different today than in years gone by, let's say during the days of the Old West, for example? I think traditionally, Tom, your, your killer, your murderer has known his victim, and there's been a connection uh, between the killer and the victim, very frequently quite a bit of animosity between the two. Today, there seems to be an emergence of the, uh, the senseless type killing where the killer does not even know his victim, the victim is nameless, the victim is faceless, 
And in the killer's mind, uh, he's kind of ripping off the establishment. Uh, keep an eye on the location. Four it's such nameless, faceless victims were the four California Highway Patrolmen killed in a shootout after answering an emergency armed robbery call. One of the two gunmen committed suicide rather than surrender. The other gunman, Bobby Davis, was captured, tried, convicted, and sent to death row at San Quentin. Shortly before California's death row was abolished, Mike Boyd of KCRA-TV News in Sacramento was granted an interview with a convicted murderer, Bobby Davis. Do you ever think about the survivors of those four highway patrolmen? The families, the brothers and the sisters, how they might feel about this? Yes, during my trial particularly, um, all four of the widows testified on the stand. I felt very sorry for them. They all had children. And the highway patrolmen themselves, away from their job, they might have been fine men. But as far as I'm concerned, I can separate the uniform from the man. I feel very bad that four men are dead, but I'm not sorry that four highway patrolmen are dead. Amplify on that. I don't know what you quite mean. Well, uh, since I was about 17, I've been treated very badly by policemen. Now, I've heard of them talking to their fellow officers uh, in different situations, and I think, well, maybe he's not too bad a person when he's at home around his family. But when they p take up this great jangling mass of keys, they strap on a gun, all these official accoutrements of authority, they just become different people. Yours is a rebellion against authority, then? Certainly it is. If you talk to some of these killers, uh, and if you talk to some of these kids who have dropped out, some of these anti-establishment groups, one word that you will find they will use more than any other word is the word hypocrisy. I think there does appear to be more hypocrisy today in our society than in years gone by, and you find more people striking out at the establishment, and they don't care who their victims are. See, um, people think that murderers are a separate class of people. Actually, we're no different than anybody else. We have the same wants, we have the same desires, we have the same problems. Now, uh, most of the killings occur on a spur-of-the-moment basis, like mine. It was all happened, boom, boom, boom. And it wasn't time to think. It wasn't time to say, should I do this or shouldn't I do it? See? There was a period in my life when I could have been changed, when I could have been helped. I'll just say this, that when a youngster commits a serious crime like ra rape, robbery, or murder, he should not be slapped on the wrist, but he should be punished, even though he is young, because if he's not punished, he develops no sense of responsibility or guilt, and then when he becomes an adult, it's almost second nature. He got by with it when he was 16, so he's going to do it again. Perhaps the most notorious murder case since Jack the Ripper, and certainly one of the strangest and most unusual, was the gruesome Tate LaBianca multiple murders perpetrated by the so-called Manson family. The bizarre motive involved the idea that the slayings would touch off a race war, a race war supposedly prophesied in the Bible and in the music of the Beatles. Mike Boyd interviewed Manson, who is something of a loner, who likes to read and to play chess, and, if the mood is right, to talk about his philosophy of life. The mind that you live in, the thought that you live in, is a family. The head of your family is Nixon. He's your father. Uh, he's lost sight of his children. He doesn't see in the back. He doesn't see in the shadows. He doesn't see in the, in, in the, on the roadsides. He doesn't see in the back of the cells. He doesn't see in the yard, in the penitentiary. You take the, the, the bottom of the world. He doesn't see the bottom. His, his eyes reach in the conscious mind, in the, in the foreground, in the free world. Uh, the penitentiary is, is in the back ground, the think chambers. These are all think chambers. How typical a criminal type was Manson? Completely untypical. I don't think we've ever had a mass murderer like Charles Manson uh, before. When we think of mass murderers, Tom, we think of Speck in Chicago who murdered the uh, nurses, Corona in California who murdered the, the uh, migrant workers, the homosexual killings in Texas, Jack the Ripper, uh, the Boston Strangler, these were all, all guys who operated alone. They were loners. Most of them were drifters of low intellect who flipped out and went on a murder spree. And they committed the murders by themselves. Manson, on the other hand, was a very intelligent guy, had a very high IQ. And to distinguish him from other mass murderers, he had this incredible power to get other people to murder for him at his command, uh, young girls from average American homes. Was he a sane individual, in your opinion? 
Well, uh, I think if you ask me, was he uh, insane, it might be an e easier way to answer it. He was insane the way Adolf Hitler was insane. Uh, he was not legally insane. Again, he knew that what he did was wrong, and the evidence of that is Manson uh, did everything possible to avoid getting caught. So he was an, ex an extremely evil person, uh, uh, extremely wicked, but he knew that what he was doing was wrong, and therefore he was not legally insane. He loved animals, and uh, he told me that one time. He said, well, Yossi, you got me all wrong. I I'm, I'm, I'm a nice person. Uh, I love animals, and I said, well, Charlie, I said, uh, well, the furnaces were stoking at places like Auschwitz and Buchenwald and uh, Treblinka, according to historians, Hitler, high up in the uh, rarefied atmosphere of Berchtesgaden in the Bavarian Alps, was very concerned over the health of his dog, Blondie. So apparently Hitler loved animals, too. So the fact you love animals does, really not, that does not mean that you're really a nice guy. Charlie Taylor thought they were delivering a new TV set. I put new locks on the doors. And we weren't gone for very long. Why, they came in broad daylight. I didn't think we had that many things worth stealing. We've got lots of reasons why a crime couldn't happen to us, but it can and does. This informative free booklet, Crime Can Be Stopped, gives you valuable ways to help protect your home. Dial direct 800-423-4444. That's 800-423-4444. Remember, no one is immune to crime. This revised, updated booklet on crime can be stopped gives you a lot of hints that might literally save your life. It talks about your home, your backyard, the kind of locks you may use to safeguard your life, even in your automobile while you're driving. It talks not only about the statistical problems we face concerning crime and the rise of crime in the United States, but the human element and what you can do where you live, especially if you're elderly and live alone. You can dial right now. The operators are waiting to take your call. If you live anywhere except California, Hawaii, or Alaska, you can dial 800-423-4444. Or in California, Hawaii, or Alaska, you can either write to me, Garner Ted Armstrong, Pasadena, California, or dial direct to area 213-577-5225. The United States is not only the murder capital of the world, it's the gun capital of the world, and many people contend there is a connection between the two. Obviously, because there are so many millions of guns in society, guns are going to figure more and more in crime. Uh, people like to argue this back and forth and up and down. I'm a sportsman. While I'm not a member of the NRA, I nevertheless subscribe to many of the sporting type uh, books, and I do go hunting. I'll probably get some hate mail on that because there are people like Charles Manson who would not think of killing an animal, yet they'll go to the grocery store and buy a steak or a lamb chop or maybe even a fried chicken. But uh, to do the animal in in a really very painless way, if it's done right, that would never occur to them as being correct. Well, I don't want to get off on that and argue on it. I'm merely saying that I do own guns of my own. And from the time my boys have been very, very tiny, I have taught them to fear and to respect firearms. I've had firearms in the house and never once in their entire lives have they tampered, played with, or in any sense misused or abused those guns. Now, on the other hand, somebody could say, well, yes, but the day is going to come and your own kid's going to kill you. Well, let's not get into that kind of an argument. Just as I'm talking in California from these television studios, a new attempt at gun registration, handgun registration, was uh, repealed or was voted down. I think the vote was something like six to two. And there is a very powerful gun lobby. I myself personally am not going to enter into it from a political point of view, but I'll just give my opinion. I would not resent whatsoever. With all the other numbers, with all the other keys, with all the other nameplates and tags and pictures and thumbprints of mine that are around in society somewhere, I do not resent having to register the fact that I possess a handgun. I would not resent that at all, nor would I resent the fact that it ought to have a registration which would pass along if I give it to somebody. The same thing has to happen if I give an automobile away. I've tried to tell my sons that an automobile is not only a conveyance, 
is a force for good, but it's also a force for great evil. In the hands of an irresponsible driver, an automobile can become a deadly weapon that can take the lives of literally dozens of people. And so it is something that has to be used in sanity, in judgment, in discretion, and it is something which is licensed. But today there are about 40 million handguns in the United States. I have warned my sons that in this society, I think the police say that about every fourth automobile that goes by on the freeway, there may be a gun inside. They're in the glove boxes of automobiles and under the seats and sometimes mounted in holsters along the steering post. They're stashed behind store counters in desk drawers, hidden in pockets, and they are carried by countless teenagers. There's somewhere between two and three million handguns being added to the nation's private stock every single year. Partly that's due to the fascination via this medium and via all of the hundreds of westerns and so on and fixation over the gun in the United States. But more and more people who buy guns are doing so today to protect themselves from other people. And usually if there's a gun present in a home during a robbery, which is about 50 percent attributable to drugs, somebody gets hurt. The question, and perhaps the controversy, is are we protecting ourselves by buying guns or are we turning our nation into an armed camp that can't help but breed additional violence? Does our national gun supply make America a safer place to live? Or will our increasing regard for guns and our increasing willingness to use them eventually result in a decreasing regard for human life and an increasing willingness to take it? An ancient and even more heated debate is that of the argument over capital punishment. Ever since Moses wrote an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and life for life, it's been a controversy. Should we take a life for a life or for several lives? Does justice demand that we do? Is that the best way to deter murder? Or is it, some claim, cruel and unusual punishment and somehow uncivilized? Should we take a life in the way of a death penalty for someone who kills? Do you believe in it? No, I do not. Do you believe that uh, there should be a death penalty? A death penalty? Yes, for someone who commits a murder or something like that. Aren't we all born to die? Well, Manson uh, claimed that there really wasn't any such thing as death. It was just a state of mind. In a gas chamber. Well, uh, he said he'd rather kill a, a human being than a bird or even a rattlesnake. Or by hanging or by an electric chair. Uh, I see what you're, you're searching for. He said uh, death was beautiful, but the hypocrisy of it, of course, is that Manson, during the trial, fought very hard for his own life. The entire Manson family was always speaking about love for your fellow man and uh, that death was not a, uh, a bad act at all, but yet they didn't kill each other, they didn't commit suicide, they all fought very hard for their own lives. So he had contradictory views on death. Should there be a supreme penalty for committing a crime? What do you think? Someone who has taken the life of another deserves the same, I think, yes. I don't think there is any crime that's worthy of death. I'm opposed to capital punishment, that is, the death penalty. When people do something very violent, can kill others, I feel that they deserve death, too. Life is seven to, uh, one to seven years. They come out, they can do it again. You know, I think a life for a life, that's what it should be. Well, I am against capital punishment. But there are certain cases that get to me, and I know I'm probably not supposed to mention things like the Manson case, but in that case, I, I feel uh, it's against my principles, but I feel that would not bother me in the least. I knew that there was a chance, you know, that I might have to shoot someone. But the chance of killing someone or of getting killed is the same chance that you have of being in an accident on the freeway. It happens to someone else, never to you. And um, I had never personally felt, you know, that, uh, that I would kill anyone. But if I did, it would be something that I had to do. And therefore the death penalty the presence or absence of it wouldn't, wouldn't change my mind at all. But we know that some people are deterred by the death penalty because we have their statements on tape. They volunteered that they were about to pull the trigger on a, on a police officer, a liquor store proprietor, a supermarket clerk, and they thought of the gas chamber and they did not pull that trigger. Uh, if the death penalty is on the books but it's never carried out and it's simply a dead letter, then I don't think it deters anyone. But if we do have executions and people know about this, you are going to deter some premeditated killers.
is the death penalty itself cruel and unusual punishment when it comes to executing the convicted murderer himself? Uh, I, was, I was on the Merv Griffin show with uh, Mel Belli, and Belli was arguing uh, for the abolition of the death penalty, and he said, Vince, uh, have you ever witnessed an execution at, at San Quentin? To illustrate to me how horrible it is. And I, I looked at him and I said, no, Mel, I haven't, but have you ever witnessed a murder? And he hadn't witnessed a murder either. But people seem to focus in on the execution of a condemned man as being cruel and unusual punishment, and they forget about the murder victim. Uh, in the Manson case, Wojtek Frakowski was stabbed 51 times, uh, shot twice, hit over the head 13 times with a gun. He was screaming into the night for his life. So murder is horrible, too. So when you say cruel and unusual, it might be cruel and unusual in the abstract, but when you think of what this person has done to another precious human being, then I think it's justice. Isn't it amazing you almost never get to meet the wives, the families of the victims? I'll bet you couldn't tell me the name of one of the wives or the family members of any one of those more than 23 or 25, whatever it was, victims, those itinerant farm laborers Juan Corona beat to death with a shovel. I imagine you cannot remember the names of the fathers and mothers or even the names of the victims of Richard Speck who killed those eight nurses in Chicago. But oh, do they love to dramatize the San Quentin gas chamber. It somehow is obscene. So if you want to know whether I am for or against capital punishment, I will say that if we are as a physical human nation going to rely upon man-made laws and we're going to rely upon the strength of an army and a navy and an air force for our dependence, for our protection, then we had better rely on the deterrent of capital punishment for murder because it seems to me anyone who takes up a gun is going to come under the uh, threat of Jesus Christ of Nazareth himself and of the Bible which says that he that lives by the sword or takes up the sword or lives by the gun, if you want to put it that way, shall die by the gun or by the sword. You ought to write for the current number of the Plain Truth magazine. We will be discussing some of these very sensitive issues in upcoming numbers, especially capital punishment and the cause of crime. You can see some of the type articles on spiritual poverty, the missing dimension in sex, Saigon before the fall, the one on astrology, why Southeast Asia is falling apart. And you can have this by return mail if you will dial right now the toll-free number 800-423-4444. Or if you live outside of uh, California, Hawaii, or Alaska, this is the number. If you live inside any one of those states, you can dial direct right now to area 213. The number is 577-5225. That's the plain truth, tabloid, newsprint, twice as often, twice the impact, and it's absolutely free of charge. In your opinion, what creates a criminal or murder in the first place? Can they be categorized as far as background? I think so, uh, but not, not across the board. Speaking, speaking in generalities, I think, Tom, if you look at the map of any big metropolitan area, almost invariably, in fact, I'll say invariably, the highest incidence of crime is in that area of the city with the highest poverty, the highest unemployment, the poorest schools. It seems to me that any culture whose media glamorizes violence, makes it seem uh, safe, and makes it seem uh, even rewarded at times, is offering a model to children. There was one famous study of uh, the effect of television on children recently that showed while televised violence doesn't make a child go out and commit an immediate act of crime or whatever, but it does give his fantasy life a model by which to think of how to handle situations. I think we are all born with a certain natural revulsion tor towards violence, uh, and yet when you see violence continually on TV, the six o'clock news, all, all of your TV programs, I would tend to think that it makes a person a little bit more desensitized to violence and therefore, in his own personal life, he might not find, or she might not find, the act of committing a violent act quite as repulsive. But I do think that in the United States, traditionally, the family has been the cornerstone of, uh, of a lifestyle. Um, and I think, yes, that, that what we've seen is, uh, in some cases anyway, that the, the family becomes the focal point of anger and hate and frustration rather than the, the fountain of love and respect and trust. Do guys belong 
on a death row or a condemned row, if there is such a row. They belong in a place like this? If they're, they've been convicted of murder and killing? Most of the people in here are just your reflections. They're your mistakes so, as a collective society. Even though they have rebelled against that society? Well, uh, who? they weren't born rebelling. They weren't born with uh, uh, the anger and frustration that they have that had to be put on them by somebody. Somebody created them. Mr. Bogliosi was uh, Charles Manson, a victim of society's neglect. Well, t to a certain extent, he had a very deprived youth. He did not know who his father was. Uh, his mother was a rather loose woman who lived with a succession of uncles, as it were. She served three years for armed robbery herself. She did not love him. Uh, he was kind of excess baggage to her. He grew up quite a bit with his aunt, who did love him, but was a very strict person, and, she, and uh, he ran away from home at an early age and took to a life of crime. So he did have a very fractured, deprived youth, and certainly uh, that couldn't have been helpful to him. The one thing that I try to point out to parents when I'm talking with them is that the problems they're experiencing are, A, symptoms, you know, the symptoms of an underlying problem, most likely, and B, that uh, in spite of what they think, they probably didn't start last week. They probably started several years ago. There was a period in my life when I could have been changed, when I could have been helped. The whole question is that of cause and effect. Almost every time you see these unbelievable, grotesque situations argued back and forth in the public or in the media, they are zeroing in on the effect. They want to talk about more police or more uh, crime centers or more psychologists or psychiatrists. They want to talk about more probation officers. They want to talk about uh, swifter justice, more, more judges, more courtrooms, more juvenile halls and detentions and farm programs and summer camps and everything of the kind. But they're always talking after the fact. They're talking about the effect. They never seem to get down to the cause. Well, for about two solid decades on the World Tomorrow on radio and now on television, I've been dealing with the cause of crime. And I still say and insist, and it's absolutely proved, that the cause is right on the living room floor in homes where there is a vast amount of information available about child rearing. It all begins in the home because criminals are made. They are not born. And you can have this book on the plain truth about child rearing absolutely free of charge if you'll write in for it. Write for these booklets, would you? The plain truth about child rearing and the one on crime can be stopped. Here's how.